They were one of the most dominant and iconic tandems that the league has ever seen, and as teammates, they played eight seasons together, went to the NBA Finals four times, and won three NBA championships. The thing is, there are many narratives about their time together as superstars, and one of the most common narratives was that Shaq carried Kobe. You hear all kinds of fans, critics, and even analysts make these claims, but is there any legitimacy to it? Today, I'll be answering that as I'm speaking from experience considering how I watched nearly every single Laker game during that era. In order to come to a conclusion on whether or not Shaq carried Kobe, all we have to do is look at the three seasons where they won the championship, seeing how those are the only ones that matter in this instance. Their first championship run came in the 1999-2000 season, and with Shaq in his prime MVP form and Kobe ascending as a young superstar, they completely steamrolled the Western Conference, finishing with a 67-15 record. Although the Lakers were running the triangle offense under Phil Jackson and Tex Winter, make no mistake, the regular offensive game plan was designed to run its way through Shaq, as the Lakers played an inside and out style of basketball. Kobe would have plenty of opportunities in isolation plays, but the vast majority of the time, the Lakers were looking to feed the big man down low. It was normal for Phil Jackson to ask Kobe to stop looking to score so much in order to get Shaq more involved. But when Shaq was having scoring streaks of his own, Jackson almost never reined him in in order to give Kobe more opportunities, which is further evidence that Los Angeles looked to run their offense primarily through O'Neal. Especially during the regular season, Shaq held a strong advantage over Kobe statistically, as the Diesel averaged 29.7 points, 13.6 rebounds, 3.8 assists, and 3 blocks on 57.4% shooting. Not only was Shaq likely the most dominant offensive player throughout the regular season, but he also finished as that season's runner-up for the Defensive Player of the Year award. Now compare his production to the Mamba, and you'll see just how big of a gap there was between the two in terms of impact as the 21-year-old Kobe put up just 22.5 points, 6.3 rebounds, 4.9 assists, and 1.6 steals on 46.8% shooting. Again, that's quite impressive for a developing star who's in his early 20s, but there was no denying that Shaq was clearly the superior player at this point. But as we all know, the NBA championship is won and lost in the playoffs, not the regular season. The first round was a hard-fought best-of-five series that went the distance. It was against their rivals, the Sacramento Kings. Although Shaq was likely the MVP of that series, Kobe was no slouch either, as he put up a monstrous stat line of his own. In the second round, the Lakers handily defeated the Phoenix Suns four games to one, and Shaq once again clearly outshined Kobe in terms of production. With that being said, Kobe's impact was still tremendously significant throughout the series, as he not only poured in decent numbers offensively, but he also completely locked down Phoenix's all-star point guard, Jason Kidd, who shot awful percentages and committed a total of 18 turnovers, thanks mostly to the Mamba smothering him consistently. In the Western Conference Finals, the Lakers and Blazers had a hard-fought seven-game series. Once again, Shaq clearly outproduced Kobe offensively, but Bryant was incredible defensively and even averaged more block shots that series than Shaq did. One thing that's often forgotten is that the Lakers were heading into the fourth quarter of Game 7, trailing by a whopping 13 points. And although the famous lob from Kobe to Shaq is the iconic moment in people's minds, many people don't realize that it was Kobe who led the charge that saved the Lakers' season, as he outscored Shaq, outassisted him, outrebounded him, and outblocked him with half the amount of turnovers. In other words, one may go as far as saying that Kobe was the one who carried the Lakers in the most crucial game of their season. On to the NBA Finals now, where the Lakers and Pacers went to six games before Los Angeles eventually clinched their first title in over a decade. Shaq was named the Finals MVP of that series, and rightly so, as he completely and utterly outclassed Kobe statistically, while playing in all six games, compared to Kobe, who missed nearly two whole games due to his famous ankle injury. Bryant did have that iconic overtime sequence in Game 4, where he took over the game after Shaq had fouled out and hit three incredibly clutch shots to seal the win for Los Angeles. Based on that game alone, you have to recognize that Kobe at least had somewhat of a positive impact on the series. But given how much Shaq dominated throughout the rest of the series, it still may be fair to say that O'Neal carried the Lakers in these finals. 
The thing is, in all three of the Lakers championship runs, the NBA championship was likely decided in the Western Conference Finals, since the two best teams overall were clearly represented by the West. If Kobe doesn't come up clutch to defeat Portland in seven games, then Shaq isn't able to dominate the NBA Finals in the first place. So in conclusion, is it fair to say that Shaq carried Kobe in the 2000 season? I would say that it's at least plausible, and I would respect someone's opinion either way. But one thing that can't be argued is that Shaq was clearly Batman in their first championship run, while Kobe played the more complimentary role of Robin. Now let's tackle the 2000-2001 season. Kobe's individual skills took a huge leap forward this season, as him and Shaq had nearly identical scoring averages at the end of the regular season but that's where they began their historic undefeated run through the Western Conference playoffs. Once again, it was the popular belief among people who followed the NBA that the Western Conference was much stronger than the Eastern Conference during this era. And with that being said, Kobe was arguably the best player on the Lakers during those interconference battles, as he efficiently filled up the stat sheet and dominated the game on both ends of the court. One of their more crucial series was their sweep over the first seeded San Antonio Spurs in the West Finals, and in that series specifically, Kobe was almost certainly the MVP of that four game stretch. When the NBA Finals came, it was O'Neal who yet again dominated on a historic level, putting up completely insane numbers regardless of the fact that he was being defended by that season's Defensive Player of the Year, Dikembe Mutombo. Considering how Kobe was arguably the best in the West playoffs, it would be insanely inappropriate to say that he was carried this season, regardless of the fact that Shaq was the definitive Finals MVP against Philadelphia. In conclusion, Kobe was not carried in 2001. This brings us now to the final championship year of the Lakers' three-peat, the 2001-2002 season. Shaq's regular season numbers indicated that he was still the premier player in Los Angeles, but Kobe put up solid all-around numbers of his own, as the Lakers finished the regular season with a 58-24 record. Once again, Kobe was pretty solid throughout the Western Conference playoffs, as they had a tough road through Portland, San Antonio, and Sacramento. He wasn't as efficient as the previous postseason, but he still produced greatly and made plenty of timely baskets that were the difference in many close games. In the seventh and deciding game against Sacramento, Kobe dropped 30 points, 10 assists, and 7 rebounds. Without his impact, Sacramento are the ones that win that series. Of course, the refs might have had something to do with that too, but that's a topic for another video. With all of that being said, Shaq consistently outproduced Kobe this postseason, and in the NBA Finals against the New Jersey Nets, the Diesel was the main reason the Lakers swept them so handily, as he deservedly won his third straight Finals MVP. Shaq absolutely dominated, as he broke the NBA Finals record for the most points scored in a four-game series. This completely overshadowed Kobe's terrific performance, as the Mamba scored roughly 27 points per game on insanely efficient shooting splits. Although Shaq deserved every Finals MVP he got, you can't deny Kobe's crucial impact when the games mattered the most. For this reason, the conclusion is that Kobe was not carried by Shaq in the 2002 season. Now let me make this extremely clear. As we reflect and evaluate the Lakers' three-peat, the evidence is clear that Shaq was the best player during those championship runs, and frankly, it wasn't all that close. He was Batman, and Kobe was Robin. Whoever argues otherwise either simply didn't watch, or is just being an extremely biased Kobe fan. Kobe was between the ages of 20 to 22, while Shaq was in his late 20s and in the prime of his career. Considering where they were at in their careers, it's understandable that this is how the pecking order unfolded. Even with this being said, I think it's extremely disrespectful to Kobe's contribution to say that Shaq carried him. When I think of the word carried, I think of LeBron dragging an injury-laden Cavs team to the NBA Finals in 2018. I think of Kobe willing the Lakers to the playoffs in 2006 with guys like Smush Parker and Kwame Brown in the starting lineup. I think of Michael Jordan willing his team of mostly crackheads to the playoffs and dropping 63 points against the first seeded Boston Celtics in 1986. Those are legitimate examples of superstars carrying their teams. 
Shaq and Kobe simultaneously steamrolling the league together as complementary superstars is far from the definition of a carry, even if Shaq was clearly the superior player. He's one of the greatest players of basketball history and is arguably the most dominant player to ever live. So making a video that asks the question, how good was Shaquille O'Neal really, may seem ridiculous when the answer seems so obvious. Really, really good. But as someone who followed the entirety of Shaq's career very closely, I can definitely say that there's some underappreciated aspects and some misconceptions about his game and legacy. Today, we're analyzing the career of Shaquille O'Neal as we attempt to gain a more thorough and educated perspective of his resume. It was no secret that Shaq was a highly coveted prospect heading into the NBA, as he was taken out of LSU with the first overall pick in the 1992 draft by the Orlando Magic. This was a very different version of the Diesel than the one that we would come to know in Los Angeles, as this younger version of Shaq was slimmer, quicker, more agile, and simply more athletic overall. In many ways, this version of Shaq strongly resembled a prime Giannis, as he had lean muscle and was capable of handling the ball and could even take it coast to coast if he wanted to. This wasn't incredibly common, as he was still a true center at his core, who relentlessly dominated the game in the paint. In his rookie season, he was 7 foot 1 inches tall and was hovering around 300 pounds and played in 81 of the 82 games as he poured in averages of 23.4 points, 13.9 rebounds, and 3.5 blocks on 56.2% shooting. Due to his dominance, the Magic improved their record over the previous season by 20 wins and he was immediately being recognized as one of the best centers in the entire league. Simply put, it was one of the all-time great debut seasons of NBA history, as the 20-year-old was one of the most NBA-ready rookies that the league has ever seen. The following season, they drafted the incredibly gifted and dynamic point guard Penny Hardaway, and this is when Shaq's magic went from simply a young team with potential to a young contender in the Eastern Conference. At this point, Shaq was only 21 years old, as he led the Magic to a 50-32 record as a sophomore, as he put up 29.3 points, 13.2 rebounds, and 2.9 blocks on 59.9% shooting. He led the league in overall field goal percentage, he was second in scoring, second in rebounding, and fourth in blocks. Again, he achieved all of this in his second season, while going up against the strongest era of the big man that the league has ever seen. In total, Shaq spent four years in Orlando and was close to winning the championship on multiple occasions. The first instance was in the 1995 NBA Finals, where his magic was famously swept by the more experienced Houston Rockets. But what many people don't realize is that despite being beat by Hakeem, Shaq had a dominant series and was certainly blameless in their defeat. The other instance was in 1996, where his 60-win Magic were eliminated in the Eastern Conference Finals by the 72-10 Chicago Bulls. Then in the summer of 1996, Shaq stunned the city of Orlando by leaving for Los Angeles where the real meat of his legacy would begin. During this era is when Shaq started to reach his peak dominating form. He did put on a significant amount of weight, but in the early years with the Lakers, much of that was sheer muscle mass. Yes, this did decrease some of the speed and agility of the diesel, but that doesn't mean that Shaq's only skill set in Los Angeles was simply overpowering people. That is a common narrative about his prime, that Shaq simply scored in bunches by bullying the opponent. And although he did certainly manhandle the opposition, it's not quite his entire skill set. One thing that's rarely mentioned is that Shaq had extremely underrated footwork. Sure, he wasn't Akeem Olajuwon or Kevin McHale, but Shaq often took advantage of every step and intelligently utilized his pivot foot to get himself into the best positions for scoring. He also had an extremely reliable jump hook shot for the instances where he wasn't close enough to simply dunk the basketball over the defender. Another specific quality that is rarely spoken of was Shaq's willingness to punish the opponent physically regardless of his God-given size. Kobe Bryant spoke about this rare mentality in an interview several years ago. For sure. I mean, this guy was a, a force like I have never seen. I mean, it was crazy. You know, a guy at that size, generally guys at that size are a little timid and they don't want to be tall. They don't want to be big. Man, this dude was, he did not care. He was mean. He was nasty. He was competitive. He was vindictive. 
For three straight years under Dell Harris, Shaq and the Lakers looked like a promising team, ready to compete for the NBA championship. But it wasn't until his first year with Phil Jackson that he would finally break through and reach the mountaintop. It also happened to be the greatest season of Shaq's career on an individual level, as he won his lone MVP in the 1999-2000 season, with averages of 29.7 points, 13.6 rebounds, 3.8 assists, and 3 blocks on 57.4% shooting. That season, he was first in scoring, second in rebounds, first in assists among centers, third in blocks, and first in field goal percentage. One thing that people often overlook is the fact that Shaq finished second overall in the Defensive Player of the Year voting behind only Alonzo Mourning. With this effort, he led his Lakers to a dominant 67-15 record and was rewarded with the MVP as a result. But in my opinion, he should have been the first unanimous MVP of NBA history, but he only received 120 of the 121 total votes, as the CNN reporter Fred Hickman voted for Allen Iverson instead, who clearly had an inferior season. Shaq would not only go on to win his first championship and his first finals MVP, but he had arguably the greatest finals MVP stretch of NBA history, challenged only by Michael Jordan's run from 1991 to 1993. There's an ongoing debate about whether or not Shaq carried Kobe during their three championship runs, and I certainly think it's disrespectful to Kobe to imply that a star of his caliber was carried. But I will say this, during that run, Shaq was the clear focal point of the Lakers' offense. The game plan was always to go through him, while the opponent's game plan was always about containing him. In other words, Shaq was the Batman to Kobe's Robin, both in terms of statistics and impact. Yes, Batman needed Robin to succeed, but let's not get it twisted. We know who was where in terms of the Lakers' hierarchy. Of the three finals MVPs, Shaq's most impressive was probably his second, as you consider how he did it against that season's Defensive Player of the Year, Dikembe Mutombo. If he, of all people, couldn't contain Shaq in the finals, then absolutely no one could have that season. After that final stretch, it was around the 2003-2004 season that Shaq's physical fitness began to decline as he put on a significant amount of weight, rumored to be around 350 pounds, which played a part in Kobe's frustration with Shaq that ultimately led to their split. At this point in his career, it was clear that Shaq was still the most dominant center in the league, but it was also apparent that his prime years were now behind him. After a disappointing finals exit in 2004, Lakers management decided that they were ready to build upon their younger star and traded Shaq to the Miami Heat. Although the Diesel had clearly lost a step, he still stood out enough to be a serious MVP candidate. Alongside of a rookie Dwayne Wade, Shaq and the Heat went on to win 59 games throughout the regular season, which was the best record in the Eastern Conference. Throughout the season, Shaq put up solid averages of 22.9 points, 10.4 rebounds, 2.7 assists, and 2.3 blocks on 60.1% shooting. He was so impactful that he barely placed second in the MVP race to Steve Nash, separated by only a total of 34 points. It's one of the more controversial MVPs of league history, seeing how Shaq bested Nash in nearly every major advanced stat, like win shares, player efficiency rating, value over replacement player, and blocks plus minus. They made it all the way to Game 7 of the East Finals before they were eliminated by the Detroit Pistons. The next year, the Heat would not only get their revenge on the Pistons, but on the league as a whole, as they defeated Detroit in the East Finals and eventually the Dallas Mavericks in the NBA Finals. It's no question that Wade was clearly the best player in those finals with his historic performance, but Shaq still efficiently chipped in as he earned his fourth and final ring. After this season specifically, Shaq's athleticism and production would begin to decline dramatically, as his career wrapped up as a journeyman, traveling from team to team seeking one last opportunity at another championship ring. Unfortunately, that additional opportunity in the finals would never come. Many have criticized Shaq for not having the greatest work ethic and have harped on the fact that Shaq didn't have the greatest longevity because he didn't always maintain his fitness. Famously, analysts like Shannon Sharp and even teammates like Kobe Bryant have perpetuated this narrative by being very harsh on O'Neal. The thing is, although I do believe there's some truth to it, I also believe that it's grossly exaggerated. Shaq played a total of 19 seasons in the NBA, which is an extremely high amount for a center, especially one of his size. 
On top of that, he was arguably the best center in the entire NBA for 14 straight seasons, and he had MVP votes in 14 of those 19 seasons while earning 15 All-Star selections. So honestly, I feel like people are nitpicking one of the greatest players of all time when they're criticizing Shaq's perceived lack of longevity. With an elite work ethic, at most, I think he gets another year or two of elite production, but that's it. When we look at his resume as a whole, Shaq made 14 All-NBA teams, 3 All-Defense teams, and was a 4-time NBA champion, a 3-time Finals MVP, the 2000 League MVP, and was the 1993 Rookie of the Year. He also led the league in field goal percentage 10 times, which is the most in NBA history, ahead of Will Chamberlain, and is double the amount of third place, which is DeAndre Jordan. He wasn't without any weakness though, as the Diesel famously struggled from the free throw line, shooting a career percentage of 52.7%. Shaq has always claimed that he made his free throws when his team needed them the most. But after much research, the statistics basically indicate that he shot roughly the same percentage regardless of what part of the game he was in. Rick Barry is among the people who offered to aid Shaquille O'Neal with his free throws, which would have involved Shaq learning an underhanded form for his foul shooting. Shaq boldly declined this offer simply for the reason that it looked ridiculous. It's unfortunate that Shaq was so prideful in this area, because if Shaq had actually been a great free throw shooter, then he likely would have finished his career as the consensus greatest player of all time. Regardless, all in all, Shaq is one of the greatest players of all time, and along with Michael Jordan and Bill Russell, he's easily one of the greatest NBA Finals performers that the league has ever seen. Draymond Green famously made comments that he could give Shaq some problems, and now, because of his ridiculous delusion, I regularly see posts like this circling around social media. Sure, there is the narrative that Dennis Rodman and Ben Wallace put the clamps on Shaquille O'Neal, but that's just not true. Here are Shaq's career averages, and these are his career averages specifically against Dennis Rodman and Ben Wallace. At best, they did a decent job of containing Shaq, but absolutely no one can put the clamps on the diesel. In all of my years of watching the game of basketball, I've never seen anyone impose his will to the degree that Shaq did. Every once in a while, it does irk me when people refer to Shaq as the most dominant player to ever play, because newsflash, Wilt Chamberlain once existed. With that being said, I kinda get it from a certain perspective. Shaq's dominance wasn't just about scoring points over the opposing player, but it was his unparalleled bullying nature. The 7 foot 1 inch 325 pound diesel was not a gentle giant in the slightest. He would use his strength, his shoulders, his elbows, and his sheer ruthlessness to dunk over the top of opposing centers. He made real life giants look like junior varsity players by how he overpowered them. Occasionally, they adapted and tried to flop, but Shaq would learn from that and sometimes held back on the punishing contact while the defender flailed backwards and had an uncontested dunk at the rim as a result. Listen, there have been other all-time great scoring bigs in NBA history, like Kareem, Hakeem, and Wilt, but none of them did it like Shaq did, as each of those other centers relied more on the finesse aspect of their game. During his prime, everyone knew the ball was getting dumped down to Shaq repeatedly. General managers knew it, and they built teams with the intent to slow him down. The opposing head coach knew it, and he game planned for it. The analysts in the pregame knew it and discussed it at length. The millions of people watching the telecast knew it, the 20,000 people in the stadium knew it, and the centers assigned to guard him knew it as well. Yet when tip-off came, there was still nothing they could do to stop it. That should be the very definition of dominance. If you want to witness this yourself, I would watch the first two games of the 2000 NBA Finals. Pay attention to how Shaq imposes his will. Pay attention to how he controls the pace of the game, and even controls the opposing team's rotations. Watch how he gets numerous players in foul trouble, and how he simultaneously opens up the floor for his three-point shooting teammates. He was truly one of a kind, and honestly, I don't think I'll see a player like him ever again. For me, the most underappreciated aspect of Shaq's game was his stellar footwork. 
There was a couple different choices for me to choose from. Shaq's passing ability and vision is something that people rarely talk about, but I gotta give the slight edge to his footwork. A lot of people view Shaq as the big dominating figure who mindlessly bullied players in the paint. Although Shaq certainly imposed his will on smaller defenders, he didn't do it without his fair share of skill. Referees are on the lookout for traveling violations, but it always felt like they kept an eye on Shaq even more critically. Opposing centers often had few ways to defend the diesel. He was the most dominant force in modern basketball history thanks mostly to his brute strength and size. But you don't get as dominant as he was without skill and knowing how to execute. In 1995, Shaq and Akeem were at the center of the debate for the title of the best big man in the entire NBA. But Hakeem basically squashed that debate as soon as the NBA Finals were played in June. It was between Shaq's Magic and Akeem's Rockets, but it was hardly a contest as the Rockets swept the Magic in just four games. Although both centers played extremely well and each put up strong numbers, it was clear which big man had firmly established himself as the man on top of the basketball world. This narrative didn't sit very well with the Diesel, who said he believed that he was still the better big man. So Shaq sent this letter to Elijahwan, challenging him to a game of one-on-one, -on -one to settle the score once and for all. Hakeem actually accepted the challenge, and hype began to swirl around the basketball world. This was such an anticipated and expected event that there was even television ads to promote the showdown. Unfortunately, Hakeem Olajuwon injured his back leading up to the event, and the matchup had to be cancelled just a day before they were set to square off. Shaq was later asked in an interview if he thought Hakeem was just looking for an excuse to back out, but Shaq had too much respect for the dream and said that he didn't believe that was the case. Let me know in the comments who you think would have won in that one-on-one -on -one scenario. So what were the 10 greatest finals MVP performances of NBA history? Well, this list is somewhat subjective, but I think I've put together a pretty good one. First, let me establish a couple details about this list. The Finals MVP award was introduced to the league in 1969, which unfortunately means that a Wilt Chamberlain performance and all of Bill Russell's performances will not be considered for the list. Yeah, it sucks, but I want to stick to the official MVP awards, and if you would like to see these legends get some love, there's plenty of other videos that do that on this channel. Also consider the fact that these are the greatest finals performances from the greatest players of all time. So just because a specific performance doesn't make the top 10 list doesn't mean that I didn't think it was great, or even that I didn't think it was amazing. It just means that the bar is set absurdly high. So with that being said, here's the list of honorable mentions. Got it? Great. Now that I've emotionally triggered some of you, let's continue. Number 10, Dwayne Wade in 2006. It was a finals matchup between the Dallas Mavericks and Wade's Miami Heat. After Dallas took a commanding 2-0 lead in the series, that's when the dynamic 24-year-old took his game to the next level and dominated the series from that point on in what was described at the time as a Jordan-esque type performance. On the series, Wade averaged 34.7 points, 7.8 rebounds, 3.8 assists, and 2.7 steals on 46.8% shooting. Three out of the final four games of the series were decided by only one one basket, and Wade's clutch gene was certainly the deciding factor in the series. Now you could argue that Wade should be higher on the list, but there's a lot of controversy tied to this series in terms of its refereeing, and this series from Wade holds the finals record for the most free throw attempts in a six game series with 97. Shaquille O'Neal in 2000 is in second place with 93 free throws, and remember, he had the hack a shack strategy helping him get that high. In game 5 alone, Wade shot 25 free throws while the entire Dallas Mavericks team shot 25 free throws as well. So again, it's an incredibly impressive performance from Wade, but due to the questions of its legitimacy, I'm afraid I can't rank him any higher than the 10th spot. Number 9. Magic Johnson in 1987 The 1987 Finals was the third and final matchup of that decade between the Lakers and Celtics. Offensively, Magic dominated this series in as many ways as possible, as it was one of the strongest dual threat series the league has ever seen in terms of his scoring and facilitating. He was also ridiculously efficient, as he shot 54.1% from the field and 96% from the free throw line. On the series, he put up 26.2 points, 13 assists, 8 rebounds, and 2.3 steals. Despite his past first tendencies, he actually led all players in scoring in 3 out of the 6 games that series. 
He also had the iconic game-winning Baby Skyhook and the crucial fourth game in Boston Garden. Magic ultimately led his Showtime Lakers to win the series in six games, and it was such a dominant performance that even Larry Bird basically conceded that Magic was the best player in the game at that point. Number 8. Shaquille O'Neal in 2002 It was the third championship of the Shaq and Kobe three-peat, and New Jersey basically never stood a chance, and the biggest reason for that was the fact that they had absolutely no answer for the Diesel, as he dominated with 36.3 points, 12.3 rebounds, 3.8 assists, and 2.8 blocks on 59.5% shooting. As a result of his presence and power in the paint, all of New Jersey's bigs were consistently in foul trouble. And to top it off, Shaq hit 45 of his 68 free throw attempts during the series, which is 66.2%. That's certainly not elite, but by Shaquille O'Neal's standards, that's fantastic. His 145 points over the course of the series is the most points ever scored in an NBA final sweep. Number 7. Michael Jordan in 1991 This was the highly anticipated matchup between Magic and Michael, the Los Angeles Lakers, and the Chicago Bulls. The Lakers took the first game, but after that point, Jordan began to take control, and the Bulls never looked back, winning the next four games straight. At one crucial stretch in Game 2, Jordan hit 13 straight field goals without a miss, and finished the game with 33, 13, and 7 on a ridiculous 83% shooting. On the series as a whole, he averaged 31.2 points, 11.4 assists, 6.6 .6 rebounds, 2.8 steals, and 1.4 blocks on 55.8% shooting. What's incredible is how he destroyed the competition at different points with his scoring and then with his facilitating, as Jordan averaged only one less assist than Magic did during the series, while being more efficient and outscoring him by nearly 13 points per game. It's worth mentioning that Jordan also hit the most crucial shot of the series, where he made this game-tying basket, which forced Game 3 to overtime, where they eventually prevailed. Number 6. Hakeem Olajuwon in 1995 in what was expected to be a colossal battle with Shaquille O'Neal and the Orlando Magic, Hakeem proved why he was the best and most skilled big man in the game, as he had a tremendous impact on almost every aspect of the game. On the series, he put up 32.8 points, 11.5 rebounds, 5.5 assists, 2 steals, and 2 blocks on 48.3% shooting. The Dream led his Rockets to sweep the Orlando Magic, and he led all players in scoring in each of the four games. Considering the fact that they were only the sixth seed, this was one of the more improbable champions of NBA history, but it also speaks volumes about Elijah Wan's clutch gene in the postseason. Number 5. Tim Duncan in 2003 It was a finals matchup between Tim Duncan's Spurs and the New Jersey Nets. Many people didn't witness this remarkable performance, as the 2003 championship was one of the least viewed NBA finals of league history but those who did see it fortunately got to see the great Tim Duncan at his very best. In this series, he put up a monstrous 24.2 points, 17 rebounds, 5.3 assists, and 5.3 blocks on 49.5% shooting. The Nets had no answer for him anywhere on the court, as he started off the series in Game 1 with 32 points, 20 rebounds, 6 assists, and 7 blocks in a 12-point victory. But the way he closed out the series was arguably even more impressive. In the championship clinching sixth game, he had 21 points, 20 rebounds, 10 assists, and 8 blocks, nearly getting the historic quadruple double. But there's actually some controversy tied to this game, as many people believe that two more block shots should have gone to Duncan. Only four players in league history have ever achieved the quadruple double, and no one has done it in the playoffs. But if these two blocks had counted toward Tim Duncan's total, then this would have been a quadruple double on the game's biggest stage and in the final game of the season. That's legendary stuff, to say the least. Number 4. Shaquille O'Neal in 2001 It was the second of the Lakers' three straight championships, and Shaq was his usual dominant self on both ends of the court. He absolutely destroyed the Philadelphia Bigs with 33 points, 15.8 rebounds, 4.8 assists, and 3.4 blocks on 57.3% shooting. Shaq bullying the opponent in the paint and putting up these numbers over a five-game series is impressive enough as is, but what makes it even more astonishing is how he did this up against that season's Defensive Player of the Year, Dikembe Mutombo, and he was still unstoppable and wasn't even contained in the slightest. On the other end, the 76ers were struggling to score in the paint, as Shaq's contested shots and his 3.4 blocks was his personal best in the finals. Number 3. LeBron James in 2016 
It's hard to overstate how incredible this finals performance was from the King, a comeback from a 3-1 deficit making one of the most iconic defensive plays of all time in the closing moments to defeat the greatest regular season team ever, the 73-9 Warriors, while delivering the first and only championship in Cleveland Cavaliers history. Over the course of that seven-game series, he put up 29.7 points, 11.3 rebounds, 8.9 assists, 2.6 steals, and 2.3 blocks on 49.4% shooting. This is the only time in NBA Finals history where a player has led both teams in all five major stat categories. Offensively, defensively, and in the clutch situations, this was a legacy-defining moment for LeBron. Number two, Michael Jordan in 1993. It was a matchup against Charles Barkley and the Phoenix Suns, where the Bulls secured their third straight championship in six games, and Jordan was arguably never better than he was in these finals. To his credit, Barkley had an incredible series of his own, but it hardly mattered because Jordan was simply on another level. On the series, he put up 41 points, 8.5 rebounds, 6.3 assists, and 1.7 steals on 50.8% shooting. He led all six games in scoring, he scored over 40 points in four straight games, including a 55-point performance in a close game four victory, and his 41 points per game is the highest average of NBA Finals history. Dan Marley of the Phoenix Suns was a strong 6'6 wing who was on the NBA's second all-defense team that season, which makes him the second best defender at his position this season. But the reality is, Michael Jordan made him look like a bad defender because of how brutally he dominated him. If Jordan had just a pretty good series, then there's a good chance that the Bulls would have lost. But because he had what some consider the greatest finals performance of all time, Chicago was able to close it out in six games. Number one, Shaquille O'Neal in 2000. Every once in a while, I go back and I watch this series, and it leaves me in awe each time, especially the first two games. In my opinion, no player has ever had a greater impact and influence on a final series than Shaq did in 2000. Over the six games, he averaged 38 points, 16.7 rebounds, 2.3 assists, and 2.7 blocks on 61.1% shooting. He led all six games in scoring, he led five out of the six games in rebounding, and he led five out of the six games in blocked shots. The Lakers' game plan was obvious heading into the series, as they ran the offense almost completely through the diesel, and yet Indiana still couldn't slow him down, regardless of Rick Smith's even having several inches on Shaq. He controlled the momentum of the game, its tempo, its physicality, and even seemingly the spirits of the opponent, as Indiana appeared demoralized at times during the opening games of Shaq's 40-point and 20-rebound performances. Between the 12 Pacers on the roster, they had a total of 159 personal fouls over the course of the six games, and of the five players who spent time guarding Shaq, they counted for 102 of those fouls. As a result, Shaq completely disrupted their rotations, as there was almost no aspect of the game where his influence couldn't be seen on the court. Kobe had his iconic moment in Game 4, where he sealed the game after Shaq fouled out. But other than that instance, Kobe had a terrible series, averaging only 15 points on 36.7% shooting. The biggest help that Shaq had was all the shooters he freed up by drawing the extra attention, by having the defense collapse upon him. So in a sense, Shaq even deserves some credit for their success as well. When you consider production and overall positive impact on the game, 2000 Shaq is my choice for the greatest finals MVP of all time. When we talk about the biggest trade steals in NBA history, what are some of the trades that come to mind? A few examples would be a rookie Kobe Bryant to the Lakers for Vlade Divac, a young James Harden to the Rockets for mediocre pieces, or Boston basically taking all of Brooklyn's future picks for an aging Kevin Garnett and Paul Pierce. The list goes on. But one of the trade deals I see so rarely mentioned was Shaquille O'Neal traded from the Lakers to the Miami Heat in 2004. It's probably because at first glance, a lot of people don't think this trade was actually a steal at all or all that lopsided. To break down the trade specifically, the Miami Heat received Shaquille O'Neal. The Lakers received Lamar Odom, Brian Grant, Karan Butler, and Miami's future first round pick. Lamar Odom was the only player in this trade that eventually contributed to the Lakers championships in 2009 and 2010. Brian Grant was a 6'9 center who was coming off of a season that he averaged only 8 points and 6 rebounds in 30 minutes per game. 
Grant went on to play only one season with the Lakers in which he averaged nearly a whopping four points and four rebounds. Karan Butler was coming off of a season where he averaged only nine points on less than 40% shooting. Karan also only spent one year with the Lakers, and although Karan Butler eventually developed into a good player, he wasn't one at the time of the trade and wasn't with the Lakers long enough to make any real impact. The Lakers did receive Miami's first round draft pick, but how valuable is that future first round pick going to be when you just gave that team Shaquille O'Neal, who now plays in a weaker Eastern Conference? Miami was obviously going to make deep playoff runs after this trade, meaning that the Miami pick that now belonged to the Lakers was essentially just a hopeful late round shot in the dark. The pick eventually turned into the 26th pick in the draft, which the Lakers used to select Jordan Farmar, who was at best a decent rotation player for the Lakers. In reality, Lamar Odom was the only solid piece the Lakers got in return for Shaq. I get that Odom was a quality player for LA and definitely had an impact for them, but let's put that into the correct perspective. For the Lakers, Lamar was a sixth man and a regular sixth man of the year candidate. If you had to trade away a still transcendent and dominant Shaquille O'Neal in a league where big men were often the best players on championship teams, who was still an elite rim protector defensively, averaging over 20 points and 12 boards, who had championship experience and was a recent three-time finals MVP, who was the best player on last year's finals and only barely into his 30s, and the best piece you got in return is a sixth man of the year candidate? How many of you would take that deal, honestly? It wasn't until Andrew Bynum was drafted and Pau Gasol was acquired in a trade from Memphis that the Lakers actually became contenders again. Both of these moves had nothing to do with the Shaq trade. The Lakers made these moves in spite of the terrible Shaq trade. This lopsided trade immediately catapulted Miami to be contenders in the Eastern Conference while the Lakers went from a yearly playoff contender to a terrible 34-48 and 48 team, well short of the playoffs. I get the Lakers were ready to part ways with Shaq, and that Kobe was the younger player who the franchise chose to build around, but as a Lakers fan, the trade felt, dare I say, rushed? It felt like the Lakers had settled for at best an arguably decent offer rather than being patient and getting the best offer for the best center in the NBA. All the time, people talk about what if Shaq and Kobe stayed together, but there's another what if that almost never gets mentioned. What if Kobe actually got a solid return of talent from the Shaq trade? As a Lakers fan, it felt like a gut punch when Shaq was traded for simply decent pieces because the writing was on the wall. Despite being in Kobe's prime, Kobe wasn't going to be competing for championships in the near future. The only part of the trade that excited me as a fan was the opportunity to see what Kobe could do without Shaq, and with mostly a bunch of scrubs on his team. At this point, we had already seen Kobe score over 50 points in only three quarters and have a nine game 40 point streak with Shaq. The thought was interesting to see what Kobe could do without Shaq demanding the ball and with Kobe literally having to carry the offense. And we all know what happened. 62 and three quarters, 35 points per game, 50 points in four straight games, and of course the 81 point game. As amazing as it was to see these incredible displays of offense, I can't help but think if the Lakers had played their cards right, they would have been able to compete for championships during Kobe's best years of his career. Regardless, this is how the story unfolded. Kobe spent his best years with below average teammates before the arrival of Gasol revived the team, and Shaq and Wade won their legendary championship together. I really wish we could see the other trade offers the Lakers could have received for Shaq if they had waited to field more offers. In this new Ultimate Team series, I make the best team I believe possible picking players from all eras of NBA history. It isn't just about how talented the teams are, but I'm also trying to build teams that would gel and execute well together. Today, we're looking at the Ultimate Lakers team. Before I get started, here are the rules you need to know. 
To build each franchise's ultimate team, I will be picking a starting five, a second unit representing each position, and then three additional rotation players at any position I choose. In total, there will be 13 roster spots. It's worth mentioning that I will not simply be building these teams based on how talented each player is, but I'll also be factoring in how well these players would do together as teammates. So without further ado, let's get into it. Starting at the point guard position is the face of Showtime, Magic Johnson. To many, and probably to most people, Magic is viewed as the greatest point guard of all time. One thing about this 6'9 floor general is that he really liked to push the tempo. The Showtime Lakers offense was ridiculously fast, and during his prime, he had guys who were solid at running in transition alongside of him. But especially on this Ultima squad, they'll be even better on the fast break. Magic's best individual season was probably in 1987, while he was named the league MVP while averaging 24 points, 12 assists, and 6 rebounds on 52% shooting from the field. At the end of the day, there was basically no doubt on who was getting this starting nod. Starting at the shooting guard spot is the one known as the Black Mamba, Kobe Bryant. What's interesting is that Kobe never really played with a top tier point guard in Los Angeles. Sure, Steve Nash was there for a bit, but that was long after Nash's prime. With Magic running the floor, Kobe will have to learn to play off ball, which will make this more like his time on the Olympic squads than anything else. Kobe ensures that this ultimate team will have a late game closer, a consistent flow of offense, and an elite perimeter defender. At his best in the 05-06 season, the Mamba averaged a ridiculous 35 points while being first team all defense. To this day, that is the highest scoring average while being first team all defense. Starting at small forward is the still active legend, LeBron James. Throughout the vast majority of his career in Los Angeles, LeBron has started at the point guard spot. But in this case, he'll have to make room for Magic, and return to his more traditional position. This should be no issue for LeBron though, as he's one of the greatest transition players that the game has ever seen. Magic used to be dishing the ball to a streaking James Worthy at the small forward spot, and as effective as that was, a streaking LeBron will be even scarier. At his Los Angeles best in 2020, James averaged 25 points, 10 assists, and 8 rebounds on 49% shooting from the field. With Magic and LeBron on the floor simultaneously, there will never be a time where the open man goes unnoticed. Starting at power forward is the former all-time leading scorer Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. He's always played at the center position. So starting the 7-2 captain at the 4 may seem crazy to some, but I actually think it makes perfect sense when you think about the way this team operates. For one, Kareem was especially great at running the floor with Magic, especially when he was younger in the early 80s. Also, Kareem's bread and butter is not to score from directly under the basket, but it's actually from the post, as he had the most indefensible shot of all time, the sky hook. At 7-2 with that shot, opposing power forwards will be begging for mercy. In 1981, Kareem put up 26 points, 10 rebounds, 3 assists, and 3 blocks on 57% shooting from the field. Starting at the center position is the diesel Shaquille O'Neal. In LA is where Shaq was at his absolute peak form, as he had the perfect combination of power and athleticism. With Kareem in the post and with Kobe and LeBron on the wings, Shaq will experience the most single man coverage that he's ever had in his life. And due to this, he'll almost certainly be shooting a career high percentage in the paint. Quite frankly, that point about single man coverage is probably applicable to every player in this starting unit and not just Shaq. During his nearly unanimous MVP run in 2000, Shaq averaged roughly 30 points, 14 rebounds, 4 assists, and 3 blocks on a league-leading 57% shooting from the field. When you look at this starting unit of Magic, Kobe, LeBron, Kareem, and Shaq, some modern basketball fans might complain about the lack of elite 3-point shooting. But honestly, I'm not sure how much that really matters if the starting unit is shooting 60% from 2-point range basically every night. 
Now on to the second unit, which is definitely strong enough to beat most starting units. The backup point guard is the Loco himself, Jerry West. Many people debate whether West should be considered as a 1 or a 2, but given the fact that he was the starting point guard during their dominant 1972 championship run, that's where I'm placing him. Although the three-point shot did not exist yet in the NBA during his career, West was a guy who certainly could have been lethal from that distance. Not only is he known as Mr. Clutch for his big game performances, but he was also one of the most underrated defenders of all time. In 1972, he averaged about 26 points, a league leading 9.7 assists and 4 rebounds on 48% shooting from the field. The backup shooting guard is the 6'1 Hall of Famer, Gail Goodrich. Without question, he's one of the most underappreciated players in the franchise's history, as he was a legitimate superstar in his own right, yet almost never gets any shine in this modern day. He was a solid pull-up shooter and was often the recipient of Jerry West's numerous assists. In their 1972 championship run, he averaged 26 points, 4 assists, and 4 rebounds on an elite 49% shooting. He may be battling for minutes with all of these incredible guards, but he'll never be a bad option when he's on the court. The backup small forward is the dominant Elgin Baylor. To this day, he holds the NBA record for the most points scored in a finals game with a total of 61, which basically sums up just how explosive he was offensively. Beyond that, he was the greatest rebounder ever for a player his size, as he intelligently used his strength and IQ to be among the league leaders on a yearly basis. In the 1961 season, Baylor put up an insane average of roughly 35 points, 20 rebounds, and 5 assists on 43% shooting from the field. He'll be right at home when he's on the court with West, as they earn the nicknames Mr. Inside and Mr. Outside. The backup power forward is the versatile two-way threat, Anthony Davis. As a superstar off the bench, AD will be able to stay healthy more often and will even be able to focus more of his energy on the defensive end of the floor. With the incredible traditional centers on the squad, he'll have even less attention on him when he looks to go to work from the post. His LA best was in 2020, where he put up 26 points, 9 rebounds, 3 assists, and 2 blocks on 50% shooting from the field. The backup center is arguably the most dominant player in the history of the game, Will Chamberlain. Maybe the biggest concern for this team will be morale and chemistry, because imagine trying to convince an elite Wilt Chamberlain to come off the bench. Regardless, that will be his responsibility on this Ultimate Squad. By the time he was in Los Angeles, Wilt had taken a step back as a scorer, yet he was still a terrifying rim protector and an elite passer from the post and in outlet situations. In 1969, he averaged 20 points, a league leading 21 rebounds and 4 assists, on 58% shooting from the field. I can only imagine the mismatches that Wilt will be taking advantage of as he faces backup centers on a nightly basis. Now on to the three rotation players. The first is the man known as Big Game James, James Worthy. This 6'9 small forward had one of the quickest first steps in basketball history, and as I mentioned before, he was extremely dangerous in transition. You would be wrong to assume that he was simply a role player, as Worthy was a legitimate star who could take over on his own. Case in point, he was the 1988 Finals MVP with one of the greatest Game 7 performances of all time. During his seven straight All-Star seasons in LA, he averaged about 20 points, 5 rebounds, and 3 assists on 53% shooting from the field. The second rotation player is another Hall of Famer, Pal Gasol. This 7-foot center slash power forward helped Kobe Bryant win back-to-back -back championships in 2009 and 2010. He did it with his finesse-style offense and with his unselfish team play. In 2010, Pau put up 18 points, 11 rebounds, and 3 assists on 54% shooting from the field. He's yet another player on this absurdly stacked roster that will struggle to get a tremendous amount of minutes, but when he's in, he'll be a safe bet to produce. 
The third rotation player, and the last spot on this roster, goes to the role-playing shooting guard, Michael Cooper. There is certainly more talented and more accomplished players who could have taken this spot. But with these last few bench spots, I'm looking for guys who can fill needed roles. There is enough superstar power on this roster, and what's needed is some three-point shooting and defense. This 6'7 wing just happens to be one of the greatest 3 and D players of all time. He made an insane 8 all-defense teams in Los Angeles, and for a while, he was a 3-point record holder in the NBA Finals. He was also insanely athletic, and was with all 5 championship teams in the 80s, proving that he has the playoff experience to belong. So here's a final look at the complete roster of this Ultimate Lakers team. Simply put, there is no weaknesses on this squad, as they are absurdly overpowered. The different rotations and lineups that could dominate are pretty much endless. When we eventually do the 2K simulation of all the teams, this team will likely be the favorite heading in. They'll probably still find a way to lose in the first round just because 2K is ridiculous like that. But in a more realistic scenario, it's hard to envision this team ever being stopped. My one major frustration with this roster is the fact that George Mikan isn't on it. But I honestly don't see what impact he could have had when there's so many great bigs ahead of him, which is why I ultimately went with Cooper for the final spot. Here is my list of honorable mentions. Should any of these players have made the roster instead? I look forward to hearing your thoughts in the comment section below. The 2000-2001 Los Angeles Lakers famously known for one of the most dominant postseason runs in sports history, led by one of the most dominant duos ever, a 29-year-old Shaquille O'Neal and a 22-year-old Kobe Bryant. This was the closest thing we ever saw to a prime Shaq and a prime Kobe on the same team. This was the biggest moment of overlap of the greatness of both players. Shaq was still at the height of his powers as Kobe was experiencing his breakout season as one of the NBA's leading scorers while continuing to be an elite defender. Additionally, this Lakers roster was arguably their deepest of any of their modern championship runs. More often than not, starting at the point guard position was the experienced veteran, Ron Harper. He shot about 47% and chipped in just 7 points a game, but his experience and reliable defensive abilities often go overlooked. The Lakers didn't have a star point guard, but people often forget how deep they were at that position because backing up Harper was Derek Fisher and Brian Shaw. Fisher was 26 years old, and although Harper started more games, Derek chipped in with numbers of 11.5 points, 4.4 assists, and 2 steals on 41% shooting. Whenever the defense would collapse on Shaq, which was basically all the time, Fisher was one of those solid options for him to kick the ball out to, as Derek shot 40% from 3-point range over the course of the regular season and shot a ridiculous 51.5% from 3-point range during the playoffs. Fisher was one of those guys who did all the little things well, whether it be hustle for the loose ball, take a charge at a crucial moment of the game, or automatically knock down free throws from Rasheed Wallace's technical fouls. Fish was the kind of role player that any team would want when the games mattered most. Brian Shaw was a large 6'6 point guard slash shooting guard. Sometimes he would back up Harper and Fish, but he would also come off the bench for Kobe as well. Shaw was another reliable option for Shaq to kick the ball out to, as he too upped his game in the playoffs, going from 31% three-point shooting in the regular season to 35% in the postseason. Shaw was also one of the best lob passers in the entire league. Kobe would sometimes be on the receiving end, but he was more known for his connections with Shaq. The alley-oop pass from Shaw to Shaq was coined the Shaw-Shaq Redemption, in reference to the movie The Shawshank Redemption, which is an all-time great movie by the way. Kobe obviously started at the two-guard spot, and this was the beginning of him torching the league. He had improved his scoring average by 6 points from the previous season, as he averaged 28.5 points, 5.9 rebounds, and 5 assists on 46.4% shooting. He was also second team all defense that year. Starting at the small forward position was the 6'7", 31-year-old Rick Fox. He was a solid contributor, putting in about 10 points, 4 rebounds, and 3 assists over the course of the season. Forgive me if I'm starting to sound repetitive at this point, but Fox was yet another reliable 3-point shooter for the ball to be kicked out to, as he shot 39.3% from that distance. Starting at the power forward was the Lakers' big acquisition in the offseason, the 6'10", Horace Grant. Horace was 35 years old at this point, so he wasn't what he once was with the Bulls and Magic, but he still chipped in with about 8.5 points and 7 rebounds a game. 
He also helped Shaq significantly with the interior defense, which was huge, considering how strong the power forward position was in the Western Conference at that time. Everyone knows about the guy starting at center, the 7 foot 1 inch, 325 pound Shaquille O'Neal, the most dominant big man since Wilt Chamberlain. Shaq was coming off of his near unanimous MVP season with almost identical numbers of 28.7 points, 12.7 rebounds, 3.7 assists, and 2.8 blocks on 57% shooting. There's not much that I could tell you about the diesel that you don't already know, but simply put, in many ways, Shaq defined that era, especially in the Western Conference. All of the contending teams were focused on acquiring big bodies to throw at Shaq in order to challenge his physicality. And yet regardless, Shaq still dominated playing bully ball. Filling out the roster was the 6'9 power forward, who was one of the most clutch role players the game has ever seen, Robert Ori. And then you had Devin George, Tyron Liu, Isaiah Ryder, Slava Medvedenko, and simply the greatest dancer of all time, Mark Madsen. Looking at the results of this group, we see that the Lakers finished with a 56-26 record, which was the second best in the league. They had the 21st ranked defense and the number 2 ranked offense that season. They beat teams by an average of 3.4 points over the course of the regular season. They historically dominated in the playoffs with a 15-1 record, although they did not have that season's MVP, who was Allen Iverson. A few of these things are the reasons the 2001 Lakers don't get more credit in the case for the GOAT team title. Because a 56 and 26 record is significantly worse than most GOAT team candidates. Plus their defense was in the bottom half of the league. And they weren't typically blowing teams out either as their margin of victory was relatively pretty low. For example, the 86 Celtics who I've already done a video on had a margin of victory that was nearly three times that of the 01 Lakers. But to completely disregard the Lakers for these reasons could be something that's lacking a bit of context. The 2001 Lakers were coming off of a season where they had just won the championship. Watching most of that regular season, they often seemed complacent and it appeared as if they were simply cruising through the regular season before they eventually turned up the intensity just in time for the playoffs. And man, did they turn it up. The Lakers won the final eight games of the regular season heading into the playoffs. Combine that with their 15-1 postseason record, and the Lakers finished the most difficult time of the year, winning 23 out of 24 games. What was incredible about this team wasn't just the fact that they went 15-1 in the playoffs, but it was who they beat to go 15-1. This was at a time when the Western Conference was stacked with talent and powerful teams. They started their postseason run up against the 50-win Portland Trailblazers, the same team that had pushed them to seven games in the Western Conference Finals the previous season. They destroyed the Blazers, sweeping them in three games with an average margin of victory of 14.7 points. The second round was against their rival, the loaded 55-win Sacramento Kings. Well, despite the hype, the Lakers swept them too, winning by an average of 9.2 points. Shaq and Kobe's imprints were all over this series, as Shaq dropped 44 points and 21 rebounds in Game 1, and then 43 points and 20 rebounds in Game 2. Then it was Kobe's turn, as he dropped 36, 7, and 7 in Game 3, and 48 points and 16 rebounds in Game 4. Surely the San Antonio Spurs would give a greater challenge. This San Antonio squad was led by Tim Duncan, David Robinson, and Derek Anderson. They had finished the regular season with a 58 and 24 record, which was the best record in the entire league, even greater than the Lakers. On top of that, San Antonio had the best defense in the league as well. The Lakers were not supposed to sweep this team. But not only did they do that, but they absolutely demolished them with an average margin of victory of a whopping 22.2 points. Kobe was leading the way, averaging 33-7-7 7 on 51% shooting. Iverson's iconic 48-point performance was good enough to steal Game 1 of the NBA Finals. But after that, it was business as usual for the Lakers, and this time it was Shaq leading the way, putting up 33 points and 16 rebounds on 57% shooting over the course of the finals. These were the averages of Shaq and Kobe over the course of the entire playoffs. You can argue who was Batman and who was Robin over these playoffs, but whoever was Robin probably put up the greatest playoff performance from a Robin in NBA history. After the season was over, everyone in the media was comparing this team to the 96 Bulls. Over time, people haven't made that comparison as much, since I think a lot of people have forgotten the context that shows just how great this team was. Ultimately, this Lakers squad had it all. Two all-time great alphas, 
a collection of shooters who are surrounding stars that demand so much of the defensive attention, clutch performers with championship level experience all over the roster, and arguably the greatest coach in NBA history. This Lakers unit would likely challenge any other all-time great team. So the question is, could any other historic team beat the 2001 Lakers in a seven game series? Let me know your thoughts in the comments section. Thanks for watching as always, make sure to like and subscribe for more NBA content, and I'll see you guys in the next video.